Helena Kapuni Reynolds is a Kanaka Oivi born and raised on Hawaii Island in the Hawaiian homestead community of Keokaha and the upper rainforest of Ola'a. He is a PhD student in the American Studies program at the University of Hawaii Manoa and a concurrent student in the Museum Studies graduate certificate program. In 2015, he earned a Master's of Arts in Anthropology with a focus in Museum and Heritage Studies from the University of Denver. His thesis was titled, Curating Ali'i Collections, Responsibility, Sensibility, and Contextualization in Hawaii-Based Museums. Please join me in welcoming Helena. Aloha e, aloha e, aloha e, aloha no na kupuna no keia aina, eia no mako, na pua o Hawaii ne. Na na ya mako, he keki valeno, mahalo no, mahalo no, mahalo no. Ua pau, ua noa. E na hoa maka maka i ākoa koa mai nei i kia hia hi, mai ka pi ina aka lā i hae hae a hiki i ka mole olu ole hua. Ano ai me ke aloha i a kākoa pau. So, good evening everyone. Um, I'm going to take a seat now. Mahalo uh, for everyone to, for coming to this lecture. Um, mahalo e na hoa, uh, ka ohana, na malihini um, for coming tonight and for um, coming to this event, and I want to also mahalo Iolani Palace for um, allowing me to speak on a topic that's very dear to my heart and is something that I've been kind of doing research on for quite a few years now. Um, again, my name is Helena Kapuni Reynolds, and as previously mentioned, I'm a, currently a PhD student at UH Manoa in American Studies, um, focusing on museum studies. I'm also a concurrent student in the Museum Studies Graduate Certificate Program, as well as a student in the Nonprofit Management Certificate Program through the Public Admin Program. The topic of my presentation tonight, um, as indicated by the title, will be focusing on the ways in which we can think of caring for our ali'i collections. And I'll kind of talk a little bit about what I mean when I use that term later on in the presentation. Um, and as was mentioned earlier, this research is really something that I conducted a few years ago as part of my master's degree um, through the University of Denver. And rather than kind of seeing this as kind of the end all or the end product of a research process, I really want to take this opportunity to say that it's really just um, a way in which we can start a dialogue around the ways in which we can better care for our um, collective heritage. Okay. So real briefly, um, an outline for the presentation that's ahead. So before I get into the actual research, I want to give a ho'olauna or an introduction into who I am and kind of where I come from, because that will really situate and kind of provide context behind why I, under, why I interpret things in very particular ways. Um, and after that, I will talk a little bit about indigenous curation what does that term mean? Where is it from? And to really think about how we might understand different practices of care within this larger framework. Afterwards, I want to start giving, providing an understanding of what I mean when I talk about Ali'i collections. It's, kind, it's a term that I use within the research, but hopefully it will, it will be something that we can all kind of understand together. Um, and after that, I'll go into some of the, my findings in terms of meeting with and talking story with folks who care for these collections on an everyday basis. Afterwards, um, after you think about these things, I want to have a brief conversation about how we might support and advocate on behalf of our museum professionals who are on the ground taking care of these collections on an everyday basis. How can we advance some of these conversations tonight and implement them perhaps in our everyday lives as museum professionals or outside? 
And after that, I'm going to actually end this talk with a creative piece. It's titled Hemele Ho'omana'o Kahua Ka'iloa. And it is an oli that I wrote um, as part of the research as a way for me to reflect on the process. And I wanted to share it with you folks tonight as a way to kind of some, bring everything together, but also to bring in and to play on the mo'olalo aspect of this series. So I hope you folks enjoy that. OK. So really quickly, I'm from the Big Island. I grew up in Hilo and Volcano. Um, my parents had a house right in Volcano Village, so I'm very used to just living in the rainforest for many, many days. Um, but my ohana is a fifth I'm a fifth generation homesteader in Kilkaha, so if you've ever been into the Hilo International Airport and you're descending on the airplane and you look at the row of houses right along the fence line, my grandmother's house is one of those houses. Um, it's a big mango tree right out front. Um, but that's where I call home. Um, I'm the youngest of four. I have two older sisters and an older brother. Um, my mother is from Kilkaha and my father is actually from Nebraska, so I have roots out in the Midwest. Um, when I was up in Denver, I got the chance to actually meet them and hang out and learn more about his side, which is fantastic. Um, and that's part of my familial genealogy, my, the mo'oku ohau of my ohana. And I use the term mo'oku ohau throughout this presentation to kind of draw in some of those connections that I see um, that really come from, that started with my childhood that I bring into how I understand the world today. So when I think of mo'oku ohau, I also think of you know, the ways, the teachers that we've had, our academic genealogies, who have, who have we learned something from, and, and you know, how do we trace our understanding of the world back to those um, individuals. And so for my academic mo'oku ohau, it really starts from my early childhood. I was a student at Kekula Kayapunio Kyokaha, um, which is the second oldest Hawaiian immersion program established in the 1980s. Um, they're now known as Ka'umeke Ka'eo Public Charter School. And while I was a student there, our curriculum was really integrated and focused around Hawaiian language and culture. You know, rather than learning about the presidents of the United States, we learned about our ali'i. We visited those places that we read about in our mo'olalo. Um, and even when we were reading stories like Pippi Longstocking for English, they were all in Hawaiian. So after graduating from Kaumeki in the sixth grade, I ended up at Kianala Ahana, which is another public charter school in Kilkaha. And from sixth to twelfth grade, I was at that school. And similar to Kekula Kaapuni, the curriculum was really centered around Hawaiian culture. So again, going to Lo'i and doing science in those types of locations. Um, I actually had a, we had a Friday class series called Napapa Nawe Loa. And the class that I was in for about two years was a Mo'oku Ohau class. So it was really about teaching students how to trace their own mo'oku ohau and mo'oku ohau of our, of our islands. Um, so I bring up this early childhood because currently, as a graduate student, those early experiences still inform the ways in which I read text, um, give presentations, understand the world. Um, and I like to honor those early efforts because it really shows and it emphasizes the work that our parents and our grandparents did in order to bring back Hawaiian language and to really create these spaces where Hawaiian language and culture can thrive with our keiki. So following high school, I didn't leave the island. I actually stayed on, in Hilo because I wasn't ready to leave. Um, I went to the University of Hawaii at Hilo and started off in an anthropology program. And really, when I went into that program, I thought that it would be great because I wanted to learn more about my culture and they actually had courses about, on Hawaiian culture. Um, but luckily for me, I went in at a time where there was a group of other Kanaka OEV students within the university and within the anthropology program, which was great because we had a support network in order to kind of work through some of the issues within the field of anthropology. Um, but also we were able to create a space where we could collectively talk about why we were in this discipline. And for most of us, it was because it provided it provided us with tools to be able to do work that would empower our communities, whether it be preserving our sites, doing oral histories, um, being on the front lines, and, and being a voice. So graduated in 2013 with my BA in anthropology and also a BA in Hawaiian studies, which I took on much later because one of my friends convinced me to, and I convinced her to be an anthropology major, so it worked out. Um, I ended up leaving because 
at that time, I wasn't sure if there was a program that fit my interests, which was in curation and museum studies. Um, and so I found a program in Denver uh, through the University of Denver. It's a private school. And I went there because uh, I wanted to study under this professor. So she's in the center. Her name's Dr. Christina Kreps. Um, she's published a lot on indigenous curation within a Southeast, Southeast Asian context. So I wanted to be able to work with her to figure out maybe if I could do something similar in Hawaii. Stayed there for about two years, graduated, um, and then made my way back to Hawaii to enter the American Studies program, mostly because that's where the Museum Studies program is housed at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Um, and you know, as a student there now, I work closely with Noel Kahanu, who's a program specialist in our department, and Dr. Karen Kosaso. Um, who's one of my close advisors. So kind of linked to this academic genealogy is this practice-based gene practice genealogy, or a lot of these internships that I did as an undergraduate and as a graduate. And these experiences also shaped why I've, I was interested in doing this research on Ali'i collections and how we care for them. As an undergrad, I, my first internship was the Vahikupuna Internship Program, which is a cultural resource management program for Native Hawaiian students and local students that really tried to provide them with basic training in doing cultural resource management work. For example, you know, I learned how to do plane table maps of different archaeological sites, how to identify sites firsthand, um, going through and surveying um, land sections in order to identify sites so that they wouldn't be targeted for development or other reasons. Um, this was my first field experience in the lower left corner. I was surveying in a thicket of how, not the best first experience for a student, but it made me realize that, you know, maybe there's another realm of cultural resource management I'd be interested. In. <laughs> that's why I found my way in museums. Um, I've also done work in the National Park Service through different internships. So I've worked in Kalaupapa, um, the Volcanoes National Park, really learning from um, different professionals about some of the challenges that they face within their individual institutions. And even when I went away for school, I tried my best to do something every summer. So I did the Smithsonian Institute for Museum Anthropology, which is a, it's a graduate institute that's geared towards providing students with training and doing material culture research. And that's where I actually met Dr. Adrienne Kepler. Uh, she came to, I talked story with her because I was really interested in some of the Le Niho Palawa or the, the well tooth pendants that they have, as well as some of their poi pounders in, their, in the collections at the National Museum of Natural History. And from after that experience, um, one of the more recent ones was the Peabody Essex Museum Native American Fellowship Program. So this program um, is funded by Mellon, and what it does is PEM, off, PEM tries to, well, they, PEM opens it up to different Native American emerging museum professionals or scholars, and what, they, what the program is designed to do is to provide those individuals with um, different skills to operate and to become leaders within their respective institutions. So it provides job training, it provides training on you know, how to give effective speeches or how to plan exhibits. Um, places students in different departments so that they can gain experience whether in education, in collections, in exhibitions. And it's really meant to address a really critical issue um, within museums is that there's a lack of native representation when you're thinking about the museum staff. I mean, there's been a great length in terms of better representation within exhibits, but when it comes to the makeup of a museum, you don't really see a lot of Native folks who are actually on the grounds taking care of collections, um, or are actually the leader of an institution. So that's why it's a really important program. So if you guys know anyone who would be interested, then I can send that information, because I would love to see more Hawaiians in this program. Okay. So just on kind of closing thoughts on these mo'oku ohau, you know, for, for me, I reflect on these things because they remind me of why I got interested in the research in the first place. You know, why even study curatorial practices or how people take care of things? And for me, it's really based off of a lot of conversations I've had over the years with folks who talk about some of the challenges we face here in Hawaii in terms of our museums and curating our collections. You know, lack of funding, lack of space, these are issues that our museums face and they won't go away anytime soon, unfortunately, but there's ways we can better care for them as well as our museum staff. 
So shifting gears a little bit, um, I was drawn to this kind of term of indigenous curation because I wanted a way to understand Hawaiian forms of curation, if that is, was or ever a thing. And so to define indigenous curation, these are some of the, the, the ways in which I understand it. It's drawn from a lot of the literature within museum studies. But the first way we can think of indigenous curation is any non-Western form of museums, curatorial models, and concepts of heritage preservation. This could include kind of tangible or physical um, places or buildings, and it can also include intangible beliefs or practices um, that deal specifically with the care of valued ancestors, possessions, knowledges, and practices. So for example, you know, in the Pacific, we, we have our Aotearoa cousins have Fare Whakairo, which is the main fare on their marae, which houses where, where they um, have pictures of deceased relatives or they house their taonga, you know, ancestral collections or objects that are very particular and um, precious to particular ivi. There's indigenous longhouses where the rafters is where they would store very family heirlooms or things that you probably wouldn't want to store on the ground. Um, Thai monasteries is another example of where religious objects are curated in a, in a way that's really intimate. People, you, they want you to engage with certain um, relics or things like that. And when we think about indigenous curation, something I want us to think about is that it doesn't necessarily equate to, um, it doesn't mean that care in the sense of caring for these objects equate to the long-term preservation of the object itself or collection. You know, care in this context could mean caring for the spiritual well-being of the collection or a community through, you know, reburying objects or allowing those things to return to a natural state through decay or destruction. So these are some of the ways that, in which I think of indigenous curation. Some other ways of understanding indigenous curation is that it's a form of intangible cultural heritage. Now, these are kind of big words, but um, the, the concept of intangible cultural heritage is actually codified within the conventions of safeguarding of the intangible cultural heritage, which was passed by the United Nations Educational Scientific Cultural Organization in 2003. And how they define intangible cultural heritage is the practices, representations, expressions, knowledge, skills, as well as instruments, objects, artifacts, and cultural spaces associated therewith that communities, groups, and in some cases individuals um, recognize as part of their cultural heritage. So adding on to that definition, intangible cultural heritage transmitted from generation to generation is constantly recreated by communities and groups in response to their environment their interaction with nature and their history, and provides them with a sense of identity and continuity, thus promoting respect for cultural diversity and human creativity. So I wanted to bring out these definitions of intangible cultural heritage because they remind us and they give us indications of other forms of intangible cultural heritage that um, we might not necessarily think as such. So for example, practices of care. Um, you know, within the anthropology field, um, museums are known as the places where anthropologists kind of grabbed what they wanted in Native communities and then they brought them back to their institution. Well, one of the critiques within the field is that, on top of the taking of those things, is that nobody really bothered to preserve or to write accounts about how those things are being cared for in the first place. There's a void in, in that kind of understanding. Um, so what intangible cultural heritage does as a concept, it helps us to try to recover and to, to learn more about how these things were preserved and cared for in the past. And I also wanted to bring up this concept that if indigenous curation is a form of intangible, care, intangible cultural heritage, then it should be considered a form of, it should be an indigenous right as kind of codified within the Universal Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So this is Article 11 of that declaration, which is really focusing on the rights of indigenous peoples to practice and revitalize their cultural traditions and customs, which can include the rights to maintain, protect, and develop the past, present, and future manifestations of their cultures, such as archeological and historical sites, artifacts, designs, ceremonies, technologies, and visual performing arts and literature. So what this means is that if we're thinking about indigenous creation or these practices as a collective, as a whole, as um, an indigenous custom or tradition that helps to maintain or protect the past, 
then we should be considering the ways in which how we can encourage these rights um, and to think about them in that sense. How do we better care for our collections but also recognize that they're really important to caring for collections in the first place? Um, so with kind of that out of the way in terms of indigenous curation as an approach, we'll take a little break because I want um, everyone here to kind of think about the following question. So what are Hawaiian forms of curation? Can we think of any that we know of that are kupuna practice that we practice today um, that reflect a different way of caring for our collections or our, or our objects? You can take your time, don't feel rushed, um, but I would love to get some feedback or thoughts on that. Mm -hmm. Right, right. So I'm glad you brought that up because hula is going to come up later in this conversation. If there's an interesting correlation, at least, in terms of the preservation of hula and how that translates over into the care of instruments or objects or things like that. Um, halal especially as not just physical places, but as groups of people are also really um, important to think of when we're thinking about caring for particular traditions. Lao Hala weaving? Mm -hmm. And you don't just put your poi in any regular bowl, do you? <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> it tastes best when it's been in the bowl that my mom kept. Mm -hmm. It's just a ceramic. Right. So food is a is an excellent example. Um, you know, there are certain ways you prepare our food, certain ways that we store food so that it lasts longer, um, certain places you would store food. Um, these are all different practices or traditions of caring, not just for objects, but you know, things that sustain us. Something else I wanted to bring up that's kind of a, a historical example, but I think there's some contemporary um, relevance is Halepoki, which are royal mausoleums. You know, Pu'uhonua Ohonaona at one point was the, the place where all of the bones of the ali'i were deposited in that hale. Um, you know, Mauna'ala serves a similar function today in terms of caring for our kupuna and our ancestors and our ali'i um, in ways that differ from, you know, standard pra practices of, of burial that a lot of us practice today. Teresa. Um, you know, like, traditionally, when it was appropriate for men or women to handle and care for certain objects. Mm -hmm. Right. So there's this, there's these notions of kapu, which I'll talk about as well. Um, you know, who has the right or who should be handling certain things or doing certain things in particular contexts. Um, these are all good points. Well done, everyone. Oh. I like your point on, th on this idea of thinking of curation as something that's living. It's definitely something that um, you know, represents and speaks to the ways in which there are ways in which we continue to, to malama or to cherish our um, you know, very important belongings um, in ways that we learn from our kupuna or from, from some of our mentors. So, with that, mahalo for that very wonderful conversation. It's very exciting to hear because, unfortunately, when I was doing this research, I didn't, t I didn't go there in terms of the research. But I would like to one day. <laughs> because, I mean, that's the question. Well, well, now we're talking about indigenous curation. Well, what did that look like? So I was like, that's another project in the future. All right, so moving on from this question, now I'll talk a little bit about what I mean when I'm talking about Ali'i collections. And this was really, this was just a way for me to try to shrink the project into one that was manageable in two years. 
because initially I thought, oh yeah, Hawaiian collections. Well, there's kind of a lot of collections. I don't, so it was this, that's why I ended up going down this path, which was quite fruitful. So when I say ali'i collections, what I'm referring to is, an, is assemblages of objects that are associated with or once owned by ali'i. So this could be objects that we know once belonged to an ali'i um, or a group of ali'i or their family or things that we may not necessarily know who it belonged to, but is clearly of the ali'i class. And when I use the term ali'i, I'm talking about Hawaii's ruling class, of course, and their relatives. Mo'oku au hao, again, going back to that concept, is really something that dictates rank and status for ali'i. So when we look back at mo'oku au hao, we can trace who got certain kapu for, from whom, or who was marrying into whose family to strengthen ties and blood relations and things like that. Um, and this, these different notions of mo'oku au hao is something that we see today as well in the care of these collections. And I'll go into to that a little bit more later. So just some examples of ali'i collections or namea bai vai ali'i is a way to think about these collections, you know, these very precious, these very valuable collections. Um, our ki'iakua, you know, god images. Featherwork, this is the pa'u, nahi ena ena's pa'u at the Bishop Museum. It's not on display anymore, unfortunately. Um, Leiniho palawa, or other types of adornments that they once wore, doesn't necessarily mean that it's quote unquote traditional objects, it could be European jewelry that they bought. I also count those as Ali'i collections because it was their things. Different weapons, different types of umeke or other types of containers that they used. Um, their personal clothing or their instruments that are different institutions now curate today. And so in, th in trying to do research on Ali'i collections, um, my questions were, well, where am I gonna study this? And so I decided to do that research at the Lyman House Memorial Museum. One, because um, it's a museum close to my heart because I'm from Hilo and that's the first place I ever, that's the first museum I ever visited. Um, but also to try and extend the conversation to the other islands. You know, a lot of, if we look at museum literature or, you know, articles on museums, a lot of it center on Oahu. So I wanted to just kind of expand that a little bit more and see what other islands had to offer. So the Lyman House Memorial Museum is located in Haile. So if you're coming into Hilo, there's like a giant pu'u be behind downtown Hilo. That's Hala'i Hill. And that area is called Haile. Um, but it was founded in 1931 by descendants of David and Sarah Lyman. So they're a Calvinist cup Calvinist couple in Hilo in the early 1830s. Um, it started off as a historic house museum, so it's the first oldest or second oldest wooden structure on the Big Island. But eventually they built um, their newer facility in the 1970s, which is pictured on the right. So they expanded from a historic house into a natural history museum as well as an ethnographic museum. They only have a single collections person there who actually takes, who does the everyday, everyday care of the collections. Um, and they have a very small collection of, of Ali'i um, stuff, essentially. Um, not really associated with any one person because they were missionary collections that they got, um, but clearly having um, a relationship with our chiefs. And when they talk about or they show Ali'i um, collections, it's usually in, an eth in the, their ethnic heritage gallery, which is currently undergoing renovations. So in a few months, go to Hilo, check out their new gallery. It'll be great. Okay, and the second institution that I chose was the Bernice Poahi Bishop Museum. It's located in Kaivi Ula on this island. It was founded in 1889 by Charles Reed Bishop in honor of Kil Ivahine Bernice Poahi Bishop, who was his wife. Uh, this museum is also an ethnographic and natural history museum. That's how it started off as, and then now it includes more of the natural sciences. And they have perhaps one of the largest collections of Ali'i, um, largest Ali'i collections in the world. A lot of their collections are things that they acquired from different ali'i. And they have a department to take care of these collections as well as their, their other collections. So this is the ethnology department. Well, while I was doing the research, they actually kind of referred to themselves as a cultural collections. So this is during the time when Betty Lou Cam was still there as a director. Um, and Hawaiian Hall as well as Kahili, the Kahili room, which I don't have up here. Um, those are two of the spaces in which they really showcase those collections. So some of the guiding questions for this research were the following. How are Ali'i collections curated at the Bernice Poahi Bishop Museum and the Lyman House Memorial Museum? 
And some, of, and some of the more specific questions within that larger question is, how are Ali'i collections conserved, handled, and stored by collection managers? In what ways are Ali'i collections represented through exhibits? And how are Native Hawaiian beliefs and practices integrated into the curation of Ali'i collections? Now, when I talk about collections managers, in the field, they're very, spe they're very specific in terms of their role. They're the, every, they're, they're the folks that do the everyday, everyday caretaking of a museum's collections, you know, the cleaning, storage, making sure everything is in place. Um, but for the research, I broaden that to also include anyone who may be interacting with those collections. So it would include, um, for example, at the Bishop, they have an assistant conservator who worked with those collections. So I included her as well because she's engaging with and helping out with that collections management process. And for this, the rest of the presentation, I'm actually going to be focusing on kind of the first and third question under the larger question. So some of the findings. So when I think about and when I interviewed and talked story with some of these collection managers of both institutions, Mo'oku Oha was really something that was talked a lot about through the interviews. And so in this book, Facing the Spears of Change, The Life and Legacy of John Papa E.E., e., it came out in 2016. It's written by Maria Lohalani Brown. Fantastic book if you haven't bought it yet. Um, she provides a definition of mo'oku auhau that I um, found to be really useful in terms of understanding what was happening. So she describes mo'oku auhau as something that we could understand as a Native Hawaiian theory, a kanaka oivi theory of understanding. And she states that mo'oku auhau is a philosophical and theoretical construct or a temporal sequence that, you know, that is chronologically plural, extending in vertical, horizontal, and diagonal directions through time. So meaning that mo'oku auhau aren't just going back into time. They can go forward into time. They cross and intersect, you know, like our ali'i, and there are many, many um, children or relatives. So thinking about mo'oku auhau as something that isn't just going, isn't something that's lineal, but it's kind of everywhere. <laughs> um, she builds on kind of on this definition of mo'oku auhau by kind of describing three forms of mo'oku auhau. So these include an intellectual genealogy, which traces the generation and transmission of knowledge and cultural practices. She talks about a conceptual genealogy, which is talking about genealogies of power and the capacity to affect change. She also talks about an aesthetic genealogy, which traces the descent of artistic intellectual production. And a fourth form of mo'oku auhau that I started to think of through my work is this idea of an institutional genealogy, an institutional mo'oku auhau, um, which is really important for museums because institutional genealogies are kind of the history of an institution as experienced by people who've worked there for years, even decades. Um, and it's within those people that we learn about the history of museums, you know, different mo different kind of high points, the low points, um, things that they learned from others. They know these relationships more than any other person in their treasure houses that, that we need to learn from. When I think about mo'oku auhau, for the Bishop Museum in particular, it's really something that helps us to redefine and reshape the history of this institution. So we know it's founded by Charles Reed Bishop. But the founding collections, the thing that makes the museum itself, its identity, is first and foremost rooted in the collections of these three ali'i vahine. So it's a museum founded on ali'i collections. And by recognizing these genealogical lines, then we can kind of understand some of the challenges that folks in the collections kind of aspect are trying to deal with in terms of managing and taking care of these collections. Furthermore, this concept of mo'oku auhau consciousness that Noi Noi Silva offers in her recent book, The Power, the Power of the Steel Tip Pen, Reconstructing Native Hawaiian Intellectual History, is another concept that helps to make sense of, well, why are they employing mo'oku auhau in very particular ways? And so within this book, she describes mo'oku auhau consciousness to refer to the writings of Joseph Moku Ohai Poi Poi and Joseph Ho'ona'awau Kanepu'u, and to talk about the ways in which they were writing, not just for themselves and for people of their time, but for their generations to come after them. They explicitly state these concepts within their writings, that their writings, so that people down the line know what was happening. And so this idea of mo'oku auhau consciousness demonstrates 
kind of a descendant-driven motive or writings. Um, but also the foresight to know that descendants will one day benefit from and will learn from labor that we've done moving forward. So when I think about these concepts, um, one of the main arguments I made in that research was that Kanako Evi and local collection managers employ a form of mo'oku oho consciousness to care for alii objects. A lot of them talked about you know, this, this sense of responsibility to care for these collections so that they're here for future generations. So other folks can learn from and appreciate those collections. Um, and I'll give a few examples. So one of the examples that folks talked about was this notion of familial traditions, things that they learned from their families, practices that they learned growing up that they still kind of live by today. So for example, one of the collection managers was talking about how she's kind of wary of handling fishing-related ali objects due to her own family traditions of women not being allowed to handle these types of objects themselves or to go fishing or to gather marine resources. So she, along with her female relatives, um, were advised to not handle these collections. And when she was describing kind of this type of prohibition, she, uses, she used the word kapu. So kapu to talk about, we cannot do that. So in any instance where she has to handle these fishing-related objects, whether or not there's someone in, if she can't find anyone to kind of help her out with it, then in one, way, one way in which she protects herself or that she tries to kind of mihi or to, for, or to ask for forgiveness is so that she'll do a pule, you know, kind of preparing herself to do that. Another aspect that they talked about was the importance of cultural mentors, mentors and the different protocols that they taught them. This is an image of um, Kumu John Kyola Lake, who passed away a few years ago. Um, but at the Bishop Museum, he was really influential for a lot of the folks who work there now. Um, they were his students. Um, and they kind of tr trace through him their mo'okua, how, how they interact with these collections today. Another person that, um, one of my, that my colleague in li at the Lyme Museum mentioned was Dennis Kiave. He, is, he used to sit on their trustee board and he is actually a woodcarver, so he brought in some of his expertise and she learned from him in terms of some of the ways in which she could better care for the collections, but also some of the challenges when it comes to using Hawaiian methods of kind of repairing things versus conservation methods. So, so it was um, really emphasizing the importance of working with these individuals. So during the interviews, um, the collection staff utilized the term protocol to describe a range of cultural, individual, and personal practices that facilitates culturally appropriate engagements with ali'i objects. So one of the staff members, for example, described protocols as practices that show gratitude and respect for the ali'i that are meant to be meaningful to the performer, so intent. So some of uh, this definition alludes to the fact that protocols are as much rooted in individual choice as they are in collective ritual. Some of the protocols that were described during the interviews um, by some of the collection staff included offering prayers in our chants, carrying a small pu'olo or a bundle of tea leaf with salt, um, whenever they're working with quote unquote spiritually heavy collections, so you know whenever you go in a, in to certain you know, houses or spaces and you just kind of feel heavy. It's those kind of instances where, where folks are trying to take some type of precaution. Sprinkling salt in storage areas is another one. So that's known as pikai. So sometimes if, if you get access and you go and you see like the little salt shards, there's still like residue of that, those types of ceremonies. Um, as well as submerging oneself in salt water as a way to cleanse. So hi'uvai. And after a long days of work and there was some some things that happened, one of the ways in which folks try to rid themselves of those kind of negative energies is to go to the beach and to just submerge. So this is something that I think a lot of us can relate to. So these are practices, as I've mentioned, that these individuals didn't come up with themselves, but are things that are rooted within things they learned from cultural mentors as well as their families. And the need to protect or to cleanse oneself after working with certain collections highlight the spiritual awareness of some of the staff and visitors when they interact with the Lee collections and other Hawaiian collections that are deemed to be too spiritually potent. So, so for example, during the research, I remember we had some folks visiting from Hawaii Island and we were looking at some of the kui ai. So at Bishop Forks, they have an ivory one that was said to be um, 
Kamehameha's kind of medicinal pounder. And the visitors did not want to touch it because they were descendants. They wanted to make sure that it was all good. They would rather just appreciate and see the object rather than actually try to touch it. And this has to do with kind of notions of mana, which I'll get a little bit into next. So engaging with Ali'i objects through protocols represent exchanges between objects and people. So one of such exchange revolves around the concept of mana, or the spiritual energy that all living and inanimate objects contain in the world. And this is a definition and understanding that, um, that one of the collection staff conveyed to me. This is Hanalei Marazan, who's the cultural advisor for Bishop Museum. So the concept of mana is particularly potent within the context of curating ali'i collections because ali'i objects are considered to be vessels that can contain the mana of the ali'i who once owned them, or of ali'i whose remains, their ivi, are incorporated into an object either as a form of reverence or defilement. And if one believes that ali'i objects possess mana, then one can recognize the need for protocols in order to facilitate positive exchanges of mana between people and ali'i objects. Such beliefs in mana are rooted in an intellectual mo'oku ohau, going back to mo'oku ohau, um, that recounts a kanaka oivi way of understanding and existing in constant relation with the world. Okay, so kind of wrapping it up. So one, another point that folks mentioned was the importance of learning from our museum kupuna. You know, these are folks who, again, have worked in institutions for a very long time who have that institutional genealogy, who have thought about these similar questions that newer folks are thinking of. So one of the kupuna that staff at Bishop Museum in particular mentioned was Auntie Pat Namaka Wigan Bacon. And she worked at the Bishop Museum from 1939 up until her retirement in the 2000s. And if you know her, she's the Hanai uh, daughter of Mary Kavena Pukui, who worked at the Bishop Museum also for a very long time. And so during the interviews, collection staff mentioned that Pukui and later Auntie Pat served as cultural advisors for the Bishop Museum before there was ever a formal title for that. For some of the collection staff conversation, conversations with Auntie Pat regarding the appropriate care of collections was crucial in shaping their interactions with Ali'i collections. One sh staff member shared a conversation that she had with Auntie Pat stating that Auntie Pat told her that, quote, you just have to be open and you have to make sure that whatever you're doing is not for yourself and that you're doing it for the good, for the appreciation, for the longevity, for the care of those pieces. And all you have to do is have a clean heart. That's all you have to do. Another staff member who also recounted a conversation with Auntie Pat described the importance of, of how things are being placed within an exhibit. So for instance, when the staff are installing umeke for an exhibit or containers, Auntie Pat suggested that they should be placed on top of a moena or a mat made of lohala and not on the ground or directly on a pedestal because that is how umeke were cared for in the past. Other examples of relational thinking that were described during the interviews include the inappropriateness of displaying sacred objects with everyday utilitarian objects. So this is, for example, probably shouldn't be displaying a kahili with a fork. Um, the careful attention to ensuring that the possessions of Ali'i rivals and enemies are not stored together in collection spaces, mm -hmm. and the ideal storage of feathered objects in storage units that are above the navel. So there's also this conversation about if things are supposed to be worn or seen above the pico, then maybe they should be stored as such as well, and the same for things that are worn or shown below the pico. So again, some of these practices reflect a mo'oku ohau of care, or a genealogy of caring for collections that preserve within them a set of ideas and beliefs of how to care for culturally significant collections in meaningful and sensitive ways. So the mo'olelo of advice and thinking through relationships that are discussed by collections managers are of interest here because they highlight the importance of cultural sensibility as a differentiating factor from standard museum collections management practice. So although the, con the, the conversations with Auntie Pat that staff members recalled reveals a professional obligation to foster appreciation of collections and to care for them indefinitely, the emphasis of approaching collections work with an open heart and with a cultural eye is reminiscent of what a Kiowa museum professional, her name is Joanne Celeste Thomas, refers to in her contribution to this really important book on collections management called Caring for American Indian Objects as the cultural element of collections management. So 
essentially the cultural element is this idea of recognizing the importance of cultural, the cultural as well as the, invention, the emotional dimension of collections care. Someday we'll have a book like this for the Pacific. That's the goal. <laughs> Third dissertation. <laughs> So why, so why does this matter? Why do we need to know about indigenous curation or the ways in which folks are caring for our collections on an everyday basis? So one, the recognition of indigenous curatorial practices as a form of professional practice is crucial for increasing diversity within museums. So I think this is a very museum specific example, but I think this idea of acknowledging and recognizing cultural experience as a form of professional experience is something that can be applicable across multiple fields. You know, folks who come into two different positions within an institution or an organization, they come into that organization not just having, you know, a degree in higher education, but sometimes they have experience in another form of culture. Maybe it's hula, maybe it's lua. And those are things that they might have to rely on when they're doing their work, especially if you're relying on them to do protocols and things like that. So when we're thinking about diversity in museums, this is something that's very recent within the field in terms of how do we increase the diversity of our staff, of our representation within museums. So as examples, the American Alliance of Museums, which is the national organization for museums across the US, has developed policies to address the issue of diversity and inclusion within the museum profession. So within their guiding statement, for example, um, they consider some of the diversity and inclusion, they consider diversity and inclusion a driver of institutional excellence and seeks out diversity of participation, thought and action. So someone who writes a lot about museums, Nicole Ivey, who works for the Center for Museum, Future of Museums, a few years ago, published a short article within the National Magazine that was talking about diversity. And in it, she talks about the need for museums to re-examine hiring practices, compensation policies, and pathways to leadership so that we make certain that museums are more inclusive workplaces. So this is the same here. How do we make museums more inclusive, especially for, for local as well as Native Hawaiian uh, museum professionals? So acknowledging the training that Kanaka OEV museum professionals bring with them from outside of the museum profession and evaluating these experiences as part of the hiring or promotion process is tantamount towards changing museum practices and fostering diversity at the Bishop Museum as well as the Lyman Museum, especially in a region where models of co-curatorship and indigenous curation have existed for quite some time. So that last reference has to do with the fact that within the Pacific, the larger Pacific, we're known as a place that innovative museum practices or models have been birthed. Um, Aotearoa, for example, have, has the bicultural model of where, for example, their national museum is, um, is set up so that Maori representation and decision making is on par with Pakeha um, decisions within that institution. Um, so here in Hawaii, We've got to catch up a little bit, but we're in a larger sphere in which these things are already happening, so we need to make it happen here as well. And when I'm talking about, about these experiences, really through the research, it became apparent that within institutions, there is a move towards implementing and recognizing protocols and, and, and Hawaiian ways of caring for collections, but those things have yet to be formally recognized as experience that is necessary for the institution. As, and as well as respecting some of the, the labor that goes into being able to do those types of things. So for example, if you want to do protocol in an institution, you, it's probably not best to ask the person in your institution who does that a day before. Give them time. It takes a lot of time to prepare. There's rituals involved when you're trying to prepare to invite a guest, to do the research, to make sure that you're doing everything properly. It's a lot of work. So that kind of work needs to be recognized as well. So in closing this part of the presentation, these are just some kind of questions we can consider um, as museum professionals, but also as community, we can ask the museum professionals too, is, you know, do you care for collections that are culturally sensitive? Do you have those kind of connections or collections? Do you consult with local cultural experts on how to care for your collections? Does your staff rely on skills they acquired outside of your institution to do their work adequately? So are, 
are they just using professional skills, or are there other cultural skills that, they're, that you're asking them to do? Are you fairly compensating museum workers for their cultural labor? You know, are you just asking it as a favor, or are they actually um, you know, getting su the support that they need to, in order to do these types of things? Or are you providing cultural advisors and or collection managers with adequate time to prepare for ceremonies and or protocols? Very important questions to consider and maybe to have conversations with, with museum staff or um, people within the community. All right, so that's the formal part of the presentation. Um, I'm not, how am I doing on time? Okay, great. This won't take too long, I promise. We'll take a little breather. Um, so we're gonna take a deep breath. Okay, because I know I just threw a lot of information at you, but we're gonna end on a semi-fun note. So I'm gonna perform Hemele um, Ho'omana'o So it's broken up, so I'll do a, a verse and then I'll talk about it. I mean, this is just a way to kind of bring us back down, um, to think about how we tell our stories, how we tell the stories of others, um, how we can best represent folks within different forms of storytelling and doing research. Um, so I hope you folks enjoy. And please excuse me, I'm gonna have to sit when I do this because I need to press the clicker. Okay. <clears throat> Eha upu au ala eha li a Na hali aloha o ka hua ka iloa Today, I want to tell a story about a journey I took as a Kanako Ivi graduate student in anthropology. This story is recounted through Hemele Ho Omana o ka hua ka iloa a mele or song that I composed using field notes, journal entries, and my lived experiences in order to convey the story of how I conducted field work for the first time at two Hawaii-based museums. As evident in the first verse, Hemele Ho'omana'o is written in the Hawaiian language, using an array of Hawaiian poetical devices and conventions to convey my experiences of learning about the curation of collections that once belonged to or are associated with Hawaii's chiefly class, otherwise known as the ali'i. The inspiration for this mele comes from two Hawaii-based museums that I visited in the summer of 2014. They are the Bisher Museum here in Oahu and the Lyman Museum in my hometown of Hilo on the island of Hawaii. As I recall my memories and past experiences through Hemele Ho'omana'o, I welcome you all to join me on this journey into my recent past and to consider how our mele help us to recollect our lives, whether they be moments of joy, hardship, sacrifice, revelation, or love in deeply meaningful ways. Aloha kua o ya ka ibi ula 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 i kanu ao na hulu manu Aloha kua o ya pi hopa Omeho o kipa na kameha meha. Meha na ke aloha o ke hoa. Hoa pili ke anu o nu u anu. We begin this journey in Oahu ka kuhiheva in the ahupua of Kapalama. There stands Kahaleho Ikeike Ana Kamehameha, the treasure house of the Kamehameha Ohana, known more commonly today as the Bernice Poahi Bishop Museum. For three weeks, I interviewed museum staff members, went on tours of their collections, storage facilities, and photographed Hawaiian Hall in the Kahili Room, two exhibit spaces showcasing Ali'i collections. All of these experiences and exercises were done with the purpose of gaining a better understanding of how Namea Vaivai Ali'i precious ali'i collections were handled, exhibited, and stored in the museum. Kahaleho Ike Ike na Kamehameha is located on lands known as Kaivi Ula, which literally translates to the red bone. The color red, known in the Hawaiian language as Ula, is, is a quintessential ali'i color. 
The feathered objects that I saw at the museum, like Akua Hulumanu, Ahuula, Kahili, and Lehulu, all contained to varying degrees millions of delicate red feathers that were carefully attached one by one by the skilled hands of Kanako Oivi ancestors. Constructed as tangible manifestations of Ali'i mana and prestige, such featherwork pieces exert presence and chiefly authority within the museum, reminding me of the genealogical roots of our Ali'i that stretch back into the depths of Pole. As the home of many of these featherwork pieces and other male vaivai Ali'i, perhaps the largest collection of Kanako Oivi chiefly possessions in the world, the Bishop Museum's role as caretaker of these collections is profound as it is immense. It is because of the museum's character as a steward of Ali'i history and culture that makes it a place both, both beloved and at times rebuffed by Kanaka Uivi who care deeply for the preservation and continual transmission of Ali'i heritage. Whether it's through their physical belongings or through commemorative mele and hula that honor their legacies, museums play a role in sharing the stories of Ali'i for generations to come. The museum was founded in 1889 when Charles Reed Bishop, a Haole businessman, established the institution to house the collections of his late wife, Bernice Powahi Bishop. Powahi was an Ali'i Vahine or chiefess, who was the great granddaughter of Kamehameha I, unifier of the Hawaiian Islands. Soon after its establishment, the museum acquired the collections of Ruth Ke'eliko Lani and Emma Kaleleo Nalani Rook, two other chiefesses with ties to the Kamehameha lineage. It is because of these genealogical connections to the museum's founding collections that Kanaka Oivi frequently refer to the museum as Kahaleho Ike Ike Ana Kamehameha, the museum that showcased and preserved the relics of the Kamehameha dynasty. During my stay on Oahu, my friend Kaui graciously opened her home to me in Nu'uanu Valley. Kaui and I first met as undergraduate students at the University of Hawaii at Hilo. We both graduated with degrees in Hawaiian Studies and Anthropology in 2013. Although I decided to leave Hawaii for my graduate work, Kaui stayed in Hawaii to attend the University of Hawaii at Manoa. I honor Kaui in this mele because without her hospitality and friendship, my research would not have been possible. Literally, I wouldn't have a place to stay. <laughs> her inclusion in the mele also serves as a reminder of the importance of relying on our relationships to our family and close friends as we traverse through various stages of life. Kaui and I were a part of a cohort of Kanako Oivi students who pursued anthropology degrees at UH Hilo around the same time. For many of us, we found ourselves in anthropology not because we were interested in becoming like Margaret Mead or Franz Boas, who are seen as kind of the founders or one of the stars of anthropology, but rather it is there that we found mentors that provided us with the skills needed to conduct community-based ethno-historical research. Being able to create a space within the department for Kanako Oivi was crucial because it allowed us to collectively share our stories with one another and to express how our worldviews and approaches to research were oftentimes in conflict with the anthropological theories and methodologies that we were taught in class. Such challenges only motivated us further to continue forging a path in anthropology and other disciplines that would serve our needs as Kanako Oivi researchers, as well as the needs of our community or communities. Reflecting on my time in Oahu, it was pleasurable um, as an experience and as in a uh, major research project. Although I was hesitant at times to ask questions, the collection staff at the Bishop Museum openly shared with me their experiences and stories, leading to a calabash of useful insights about the curation of Ali'i collections. I learned, for example, that advice from Kanaka Oivi community leaders, as well as an individual's experiences, shaped how individual collection managers cared for Ali'i collections. These same sentiments of working with others and drawing from one's own beliefs and practices were also expressed by collection staff at the Lyman Museum. My fieldwork thus far was going smoothly, but that all changed once Anna made her way to Hawaii. <laughs> oh, Anna no ke aloha ho o kahi. Kahi ma kani nui hele ululu. Ulua e ke aloha no ke o kaha O ke o kaha no ka uli a I was to leave for Hilo in two days when I received a frantic phone call from my eldest sister. She wanted me to return immediately to the Big Island as soon as possible for Anna, the tropical storm that was brewing in the Pacific Ocean just east of Hilo, 
was forecasted to directly hit Hawaii Island. She wanted me to come home sooner to care for my grandmother during the storm. Convinced that I was needed, I frantically wrapped up my research and thanked the staff at the Bishop Museum. Although my plans were to purchase a small makana or gift to leave with the staff as a token of my appreciation, this was not to be the case. But I did send some makana afterwards in the mail, so it was all good. <laughs> 30 minutes later, I was at the Honolulu International Airport on my way home for the first time in a few months. As the plane made its descent flying parallel above the Hamakua coast as it usually does, or did, I, I suddenly was overwhelmed by a flood of emotions as I reminisced about my home, the Hawaiian homestead of Keokaha. Keokaha is located on the outskirts of Hilo Town in the Ahupua'a of Waiakea, the largest Ahupua'a on Hawaii Island. It is the place where I learned how to swim, where I went to school from kindergarten through 12th grade, and where my family has called home for five generations. Most importantly, it was the place where my grandmother, whom I fondly call Grandma, waited patiently every day for my return home. Leaving Hawaii for graduate school was a painful de decision for me. It meant that I had to leave my grandma behind. After my parents passed away respectively in 2010 and 2011, and prior to leaving to Denver, I lived with Grandma full time. We talked, we laughed, we fought, we cried, and probably the only grandchild that she'll fight with. And she purposefully fights with me, I promise. <laughs> she would tell me about her life growing up in Hilo in the early to mid 20th century, and I would ask her about my ancestors and my relatives, whom I've never met, having returned to Po before my birth. Grandma is my cherished source of knowledge and my best friend. Thus, having to leave her in pursuit of higher education was a moral dilemma that still challenges me today. Grandma is 91 years old now and I constantly reflect on the sacrifices that we make in pursuit of higher education or moving away for job opportunities or being able to make a living. And although a college education does lead to one's personal development as a scholar and as a human being, what or who is lost during prolonged departures from their community? And how do we recognize these sacrifices and draw from it as a source of humility and empowerment? I find these questions important to ask for they remind me of the exigency the importance of our research alongside the need to cherish and to care for our loved ones. Ola i mana ka hale ka hiko Ka hiko ia ina me ama ka mai Mai ole ke aloha no hala i Halai ka ho o ki pa malihini Malihini ole a haili kula manu Ka manu miki ala o kala ni pua O ike ike mai la ku u aloha our second museum destination on this journey takes us to the Lyman House Memorial Museum, located on Hawaii Okeave in the quaint town of Hilo. Situated in the face of Hala'i Hill, um, near an area known as Haile Kulamanu, the Lyman Museum was founded in 1930 in an effort to preserve the home of Sarah and David Lyman, a Calvinist missionary couple who settled in Hilo in the 1830s from demolition. Through their efforts, through the efforts of their descendants, the mission house remains as the oldest intact wooden structure on Hawaii Island, which quite literally makes it a hale kahiko, an old house. In the 1970s, the Lyman Museum built another facility adjacent to the Lyman House to build museum exhibits and to store their collections. It is within this newer building that their small collection of ali'i materials are exhibited and stored. For centuries, the cornerstone of museums, like the Lyman Museum, have been their role as physical repositories of collections that are valued for their cultural, historical, or scientific significance. These collections are, in some ways, the adornments of each institution, each adding to the overall visual and cultural impact of a museum. Like my experiences at the Bishop Museum, the staff at the Lyman Museum were more, willing, were more than willing to host me and to answer my numerous questions. 
In comparison, however, my fieldwork at the Lyman Museum felt more like a homecoming. Prior to arriving there in my capacity as a researcher, I worked with their staff in the past on a variety of collections-based projects. Namely, two of the most influential people that I worked with at the Lyman were Lynn Kalanipua Elia and Mickey Bulos. Lynn is of Kanaka Maoli descent and was born and raised in the district of Puna on Hawaii Island. She was and still is the museum's registrar and collection manager, which is two positions combined into one, so plenty work. Mickey came to the Lyman Museum in 2011 and was born and raised in California. Unfortunately, during my field work, she was preparing to return to California to take on a museum position there. I honor both Lynn and Mickey in my melee because they wholeheartedly embraced my research and interest in the museum and actively worked to make the institution more accessible to communities across Hawaii Island. Even when I critiqued the museum for its 40-year-old exhibits and their renovation plans for their Island Heritage Gallery, they genuinely listened to my concerns and critiques. At one point, Kalanipua even arranged for the two of us to visit Hulihe'e Palace, a former royal summer palace for the Ali'i on the opposite side of Hawaii Island. While there, we talked with their staff about the palace, its history, and some of the challenges they face in caring for a building so close to the ocean. It was an experience that I will always cherish. Spending time at the Lyman Museum has always reminded me of the individuals who genuinely, genuinely care for collections and communities that are oftentimes forgotten through our institutional critiques of museums. This can oftentimes obfuscate or erase the efforts that Kanaka Oivi and local museum professionals in these spaces are attempting to make, especially with regards to developing and implementing culturally appropriate methods of caring for our Ali'i collections. At places like the Lyman Museum and the Bishop Museum, I was fortunate enough to learn from these individuals as they delved into the ways that our Ali'i collections are cared for within Hawaii-based museums. Haina ia mayana kapuana. Thus, we've reached the end of this journey. In November 2015, a few months after my hua ka'iloa to the Bishop Museum and the Lyman Museum, I successfully defended my MA thesis. I performed Hemele Ho'omana'o ka hua ka'iloa as the beginning of my defense as a means to foreground Hawaiian methods of knowledge transformation and dissemination. It also allowed me to evoke the experiences that led me to write about the curation of Ali'i collections in the way that I did. Today, I perform Hemele Ho'omana'o not only as a way to recollect that experience, but also as a tribute to those museum workers and community members dedicated to caring for our treasured stories and collections in museums. Mahalo ya oko pakahia pao no ka mai. Haina ia mai ana kapuana Na hali aloha o ka hua ka i hele loa e So mahalo nui, Helena, for sharing your mo'olelo and your mana'o and your ike and blessing us with that knowledge. Um, we do have to close up by 6.30, so uh, we only have a short time for a Q&A. Uh, I know some of us need to hele on out. But yeah, does anybody have any questions? And if anyone wants to shoot me questions, there's my email. Very simple. Oh, you have a question? And if you could speak in the mic too for the... Thank you. Aloha, and thank you. thank you for your presentation. What do you feel um, we should change immediately? What, what is the most pressing on your heart that we can do? Because I'm uh, with the Daughters of Hawaii, mm. so Hulihe'i Palace and Hanaya Kamalama are places that are most interested mm -hmm. for me. Very good question. I think one of the most immediate things that we can do as institutions is to really to start that conversation within our own spaces. You know, whether it's um, here at Iolani Palace or at the Bishop Museum, having those conversations with the folks on the ground who are caring for collections, identifying some of their needs, um, trying to identify folks in the community who are really interested in helping out and figuring out how can we better care for collections in ways that um, are more respectful, are more appropriate. Those are some of the, the the starting points. We always have to start off with, someone has to start that conversation. And from those conversations, we can build and change policy or develop different methods or things like that. So, yeah.
Hi, Helena. You did wonderful. Um, just a quick question. I was wondering, so with all the new techniques in curating things, mm -hmm. in caring for things, um, I wonder how museum professionals are balancing these new technologies with more traditional and indigenous ways of thinking mm -hmm. and how you can kind of combine those or decide whether it's respectful or not. Because, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it might increase the longevity, but you were talking about longevity is not mm -hmm. always the goal. But I wonder how you mm -hmm. see that process. Uh, wonderful question. So the, so in thinking about the, so the question for me is, a, is really a question about um, you know, thinking about within an age where digital technologies and these new medias are everywhere and are, you're seeing them more within museums, you know, what are the ways in which we can use them in the ways that are appropriate and perhaps what are ways that are not appropriate? And so something that comes to mind for me is this question about accessibility so within, with digital technologies, you know, digitizing collections is something that you see a lot in museum fields. You've, if, if you're on different social media ask, um, programs or things like Facebook, they'll have like articles once in a while of, you know, the New York Library digitized all these collections and it's all free. Yeah. Well, for indigenous collections, maybe some of those materials aren't meant to be accessed for everyone. So in implementing or utilizing those technologies within museums, the question becomes, okay, what is okay to share? And if we have questions about what we can't share, who can we talk to to talk to clarify that? You know, is it okay if we share some of these pictures of Ki'i with a broader audience? Is it okay to be just sharing it digitally? Um, so those are some of the questions that, that come to mind when I think about that particular realm of technology. But this is not to say that technology is always something that is detrimental to indigenous kind of practices or ways of understanding. There are ways in which tribal communities, for example, or tribal museums are utilizing those in ways to reach broader audiences, but also to present their story in a much more dynamic and complex way. But yeah, yeah, good question. Any other questions? You obviously had quite a working relationship with people were the hands-on people. Did you, were you able to talk with the administrators, the, the people who were at the top of these institutions, mm -hmm. and how much support are they giving to this whole idea, you know? Very good question. Mm -hmm. How can I phrase this? Um, <laughs> so, when I was at the, the Bishop Museum, I did get a chance to talk with um, the director as well as the legal counsel at the time. So this would have been Blair Collis and Noah Detweiler. Um, and they seemed very open about these conversations and to, to talking about these things. Um, at the Lyman Museum, oh, I forget her last name. Barbara is her first, is her first name. Um, but I know, I've known Barbara for a long time and I didn't really spend too much time talking with, with Barbara per se because I mean, as a whole, is not necessarily geared towards focusing on Hawaiian things. Um, so I really wanted to focus in on the folks who are dealing on the everyday. Um, but I had to talk with, I wanted to talk with Blair. Well, actually, the director of the cultural collections at the time, Betty Lou Cam, set up these interviews for me, and I wasn't expecting to talk with, with the, the leaders, essentially, of these institutions, but she helped me to set them up to kind of foreground what they were trying to do at that time. Um, so I really thank her for that. Um, but for my research, I, I really wanted to focus on kind of the ground up. I'm, I'm a very ground up person. That must be the, the immersion student in me because <laughs> immersion for years was always uh, the parents and the teachers got to go lobby the legislature for their funds. So maybe that's where that genealogy comes from for me. Um, but I'm always interested in, uh, for the people that don't necessarily have the voices. Um, you know, something I didn't talk about here, but I talk about within the um, thesis is that when I think of, when people think of institutional genealogies, especially for places like the Bishop Museum, that genealogy is usually just connected to the directors and what they did. And that's important, but at the same time, what are the stories of those other people who have been there for so long? You know, we, we know about people like Mary Kavena Pukui, but who knows about Lahi Lahi Webb? She used to be 
she was the pre Pukui essentially. She worked at the Bisha Museum for a very, very long time and really helped influence how they understand and, and care for the collections. She helped, she's a part of the genealogy of care that Pukui and Auntie Pat is a part of, and now the folks that are there now who got to talk story with Auntie Pat. Um, so yeah, I think that that's part of, partly is just my own preference in terms of who I want to talk to, I guess. I like talking to like the everyday folks because I'm an everyday folk myself. <laughs> but yeah, mahalo, good question. <laughs> right? <laughs> these are all, these are all other, I have, a, I have my list of projects that I need to get done. Um, so for the PhD, my, my museum research is actually taking a seat on the back burner for now. Because, so my, my master's was about what I wanted to do, which is the museums. My PhD is really what I need to do. And for me, that is, creating a dissertation and a book, hopefully, out of it that covers the history of Kaukaha. Um, so really talking about the history of homesteading there, um, paying tribute to and recognizing a lot of the efforts of, of early folks within the community who established the community, who fought for rights for Hawaiian homesteaders, especially there, bringing up um, kind of histories of protest um, and thinking about how Keokaha has kind of served as this place where Hawaiians kind of mingle and become political. It's quite, there's a lot of interesting things happening in Keokaha, which you guys will read about if I ever get it published, but in, in like five or six years. No, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> And then, but it's not, doesn't mean it's the end of the museum stuff. What I want to end on for that project is that is this kind of envisioning what a cultural center or a community center for the community would look like. Mm -hmm. So trying to bring back that conversation about, well, what would a Hawaii museum look like? Do we have to stick with the, the mainstream model of what a museum is? Or what would that look like within a Hawaiian community based within community values um, and practices? And I'm not the first person in my community to envision a museum. It's actually attached to a longer genealogy of folks saying, we want a museum, and this is what we want. So. So that's, that's, that's where I'm at right now. <laughs> Mahalo again. Okay. Thank you, everyone.